third speaker, Ms. Sherry Jones, attorney at law and author. Ms. Lisa Bino, Director, Organizational Development at CIBC First Caribbean International Bank. Professor Troy Lord, Dean of Faculty of Social Sciences, University of the West Indies, Cape Hill Campus. Dr. Halima Deshong, Senior Lecturer and Head, Institute for Gender and Development Studies, Nitabaro Unit. Members of the Leacock family, members of the campus community and CIBC First Caribbean colleagues, specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening and welcome to the 2023 International Women's Day Distinguished Lecture, jointly sponsored by the Institute for Gender and Development Studies, Nita Barra Unit, and CIBC First Caribbean International Bank Limited. This evening, we are grateful to be able to gather in person once again, after the last couple of years restrictions brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. Let me begin by introducing myself. I'm Deborah King, the Director of Corporate Communications at CIBC First Caribbean, and I will take you through this evening's proceedings. We will begin the evening with welcome remarks from our partner in this event, the Institute for Gender and Development Studies, Nita Barra Unit, represented this evening by its head and senior lecturer, Dr. Halima Deshaun. Dr. Deshaun. Thank you very much, Chair. And I recognize you, Mrs. Deborah King, um, featured speaker, Ms. Sherry Jones, attorney at law and author, Ms. Lisa Bino, Director, Organizational Development, CIBC First Caribbean International Bank, Professor Winston Moore, Deputy Principal, the University of the West Indies Cape Hill Campus, Professor Troy Lord, Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences of the UWI Cape Hill Campus, members of the Leacock family, members of the campus community, specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and happy International Women's Day. It is with much joy that I bid you a warm welcome to the Institute for Gender and Development Studies, Nita Bar Unit's International Women's Day Distinguished Lecture, sponsored by our valued partner, CIBC First Caribbean International Bank, and delivered this year by Barbadian author and attorney at law, Sherry Jones. International Women's Day is our annual celebration of differently located women in our fullness. It is our annual invitation to all to reflect on the operation of gender in our lives, in our social relations, in our families, at work, and on our planet. We do this with a keen awareness of the differences which exist among women, while continuing to name and confront the structural arrangements which produce enduring gender inequalities. It is a day on which we recognize the invaluable contribution of women organizing to transform our homes, our communities, our countries, our regions, and our world. Caribbean women's rights and feminist activists have historically occupied the vanguard of organizing to secure social justice in societies with a history of interlocking race, gender, ableist, and geographic inequalities. One of the two themes for International Women's Day, hashtag Embrace Equality, invites us to recommit to the promise Caribbean governments have made to their people as signatories to the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the CEDAW Convention, and the Beijing Platform for Action. This commitment is articulated across the gender policies to have emerged and that are emerging across several countries in the, in the Caribbean, including right here in Barbados. It is a commitment reiterated among some Barbadians engaging in cons the, constitutional, the current constitutional reform process. On International Women's Day and during the entire month of March, recognized as her story and International Women's Month, we take the opportunity to celebrate Caribbean women across the history of the region. 
In this regard, I am honored to have among us the family of our First Lady of Song here in Barbados, the late Carolyn Leacock. Thank you for allowing us to recognize and celebrate her legacy on International Women's Day. I was first introduced to Carolyn when I as I watched from St. Vincent and the Grenadines and shared while she, alongside her brother James, emerged as winners of the 1994 Caribbean Song Festival. The quality of exuding beauty, class, and sophistication described by her niece, Nikita, was felt by those of us who at some point had the pleasure of being in the same room with Carolyn Leacock. On International Women's Day, we honor her tremendous mentorship of newer artists, her work with church the church community, and the joy she brought to so many of us with her incredible catalog of music and performances. In this regard, we, we are delighted to welcome back to the International Women's Day stage, Barbados' only all-woman band, Tenantry. Each year, our relationship with CIBC First Caribbean Bank deepens. We share a mutual commitment to securing gender justice and the empowerment of women and girls. On behalf of the Institute for Gender and Development Studies, Nita Barra Unit, and the Cable Campus, I take this opportunity to reiterate our gratitude for this partnership and for remaining fully engaged in all organizational aspects of the delivery of this lecture. I do not exaggerate when I say that to us, you are more than sponsors. You are part of our family, especially and forgive me for this, Anthony, Chantal, and Deborah, and we feel part of yours as well. International Women's Day calls on us to think about how we might have, we have been shifting and we continue to main, and in some ways we continue to maintain unequal relations of gender and the implications of these arrangements for diverse women and girls across our societies. I remember stories from my great grandmother about growing up in the countryside in St. Vincent and the Grenadines about her education being cut short so that she could join her mother as an agricultural worker to support her siblings. I think about the structural and historical arrangements which produce those conditions of work, family, and socioeconomic realities. Vincentian-born domestic worker, Elma Francois, who founded the Negro Welfare Cultural and, Cultural and Social Association and the workers' struggle for change in Trinidad and Tobago in the 1930s, provide us with the conceptual tools to situate the exploitative conditions of work for those who do not benefit from the surplus value produced by their labor. It is through analyses provided by Caribbean radical intellectuals like Elma Francois, Claudia Jones, Calypso Rose, and our grandmothers that we learn specifically about how working class women headed households are especially economically disadvantaged. From these women, we learn more generally about the interlocking systems of power and existing avenues for social transformation. And to learn more about gender power and change, we invite you to participate in the teaching and outreach of the Nita Barra Unit. Sign up for our courses at the graduate, undergraduate, and certificate level. And I say a shout out to the students I see in the audience. Our program of teaching, research, and outreach provide the analytical tools to make sense of some of the most pressing questions of our time, including interlocking concerns about the state of our economies and societies, work, the climate crisis, and this year's UN Women's theme for International Women's Day on innovation and technology for gender equality. Now I wish to close um, by paying special tribute to our featured speaker, Sherry Jones. Grenadian-born poet Audre Lorde, whose life and work reveal a commitment to feminist organizing and building solidarity communities, reflected on the role of poetry, wrote, and I, and I quote, for women, poetry is not a luxury. It is a vital necessity of our existence. It forms the quality of the light within which we predicate our hopes and dreams towards survival and change. First made into language, then into idea, then into more tangible action. Poetry is the way we help give name to the nameless so that it can be thought. Poetry is not only dream and vision. It is the skeleton architecture of our lives. It lays the foundations for a future of change, a bridge across our fears of what has never been before." End of quote. I extrapolate this definition of poetry from Audre Lorde and extend what she offers for how we might engage our Caribbean tradition of storing in oral, written, and visual forms. Sherry, 
This is precisely what I felt in reading How the One Arm Sister Sweeps a House. Readers are introduced to a powerful autonomous Lala in her interior moments. Early we learn that the woman she aspires to be, of the woman she aspires to be, free from the personal and structural conditions which limit her capacity to function autonomously. What Audre Lorde tells us about poetry, what George Lamin tells us about the creative imagination, and what, and what you show us through Lala signals our individual and collective capacity for social transformation. Transformation of thought, of actions, of self, of structures, and of systems. Our cultural griots, whether in poetry, prose, calypso, reggae, dance hall, and the stories of our grandmothers, remain central to realizing our imagined lives. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for joining us. Have a delightful evening. Peace and blessings. Thank you very much, Dr. Deshaun. Ladies and gentlemen, CIBC First Caribbean has distinguished itself as one of the flag bearers in support of its female employees, having established innovative programs such as a women's network which supports its senior female staff by providing networking and mentorship opportunities. This year, the bank has introduced increased maternity leave benefits for both new mothers and fathers, and for those parents adopting or becoming parents through surrogacy. These are but a few of the policies that the bank has introduced, and if my voice swells with pride, it's because I'm very proud, <laughs> as it has supported its workforce in navigating this new world of work. We are fortunate to have with us this evening our new Director of Organizational Development, Ms. Lisa Bino, who will offer remarks on behalf of the bank. Lisa is a successful entrepreneur, occupational psychologist, senior HR professional, business transformation consultant, and motivational speaker. Having completed her university training in the United Kingdom, including a master's in occupational psychology, Lisa specialized in leadership development, succession planning, personality profiling, job profiling, and executive assessment and recruitment. In addition to completing several work stints in the UK, she has worked in Barbados and the region for cable and wireless, for the CARICOM Secretariat, and also founded her own successful business as a management consultant. Lisa joined us at the bank in this year, 2023, where she focuses on transformation, cultural change, communications, and engagement. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Lisa Bino. protocols being observed, let me welcome you and say good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to be here with you this evening for what promises to be an insightful and informative lecture to be presented by acclaimed writer, Cherie Jones. As I was preparing these remarks, it, I was reflecting and I thought, you know what? I am the product of some strong women. From my grandmother, who worked the fields to ensure that her children would have the best, to my great aunt, who was actually the first of her family to get a high school education, and then my mother, who dreamed of being educated and improving herself, but struggled to do so because she lived in a time where women needed the permissions of their fathers and their husbands to be educated. But my mother, as a result of her experience, raised us to value education above riches. She said, as long as you had education 
and the drive to succeed, you will be successful. So the fact that I can stand here in front of you today as a relatively new member of CIBC, literally two months tomorrow, I certainly could not have done that if it wasn't for the input of a strong woman like my mother. And when I look at all of you, I suspect you have very similar stories. You too are the product of some very strong women. We at CIBC First Caribbean are delighted for the eighth year running to partner with the Institute for Gender and Development Studies, Nita Barra Unit, to host this public lecture to mark International Women's Day. Our ties with the University of the West, Indi West Indies runs deep, extending to all of the campuses across the region. Here at Cave Hill, we have forged solid partnerships across several faculties, and we support a myriad of activities from lectures to entrepreneurship, research, and innovation. Let me take this opportunity to offer hearty congratulations to UE as it celebrates 75 years and the Cave Hill campus, which is also marking its diamond anniversary. Long may the brown pelicans soar magnificently over our region. During a recent courtesy call with your principal and pro vice chancellor, Professor Clive Landis, and our chief executive officer, Mr. Mark St. Hill, they described the bank's relationship with UE as a model partnership. Professor Landis said it was a win-win-win relationship. A win for the bank, a win for the university, and a win for the students. This so perfectly sums up what has characterized our memorandum of understanding with UE. One of the first MOUs that First Caribbean signed when it was formed over 20 years ago. Since that time, we have awarded over 300 undergraduate and postgraduate scholarships and research grants. We have also supported the physical expansion of the campus with the CIBC First Caribbean Suites in the Solutions Center. The bank has supported the Student Entrepreneurial Empowerment Development Program, otherwise known as SEED, which has birthed numerous small entrepreneurs over the years. There are so many more programs and areas of cooperation between us, but time does not permit me to go into all of them now. I'll just add that the digital and technological thrust at our bank is powered almost exclusively by UE graduates. Well over half of the bank staff are female, and as many of you know well, our immediate past CEO was female, the first to head our bank. Many female staffers occupy very senior positions as executives, directors, and senior managers throughout our organization. I am very pleased that we have put in place the kinds of policies that Deborah talked about that acknowledge the unique challenges facing women at all levels in our organization. Our remote work policy allows all staff to work from homes, from their home on the day of their choosing. This has been a game changer for countless women and men across our enterprise, especially those who juggle child and family care. International Women's Day is important at our bank. Diversity and inclusion are the core of who we are. Today, across the region, our staff engage in a number of activities, both in-house and across the communities where we are located. They reach out to at-risk girls and women and have brought hope to those in institutions. We remain deeply committed to the communities where we are located and will continue to be active and engaged in activities such as tonight's lecture. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. And as Lisa indicated in her remarks, it's no secret, no secret that the UWI and the bank enjoy a very close relationship with the UWI having been the first partner with which we established a formal memorandum of understanding back in 2002 when the bank was formed. Please welcome to the podium, Professor Troy Lord, the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences here at Cave Hill to address you. Mrs. Weber King, Chair of the evening's proceedings. Featured speaker, Ms. Sherry Jones, attorney at law and author. Ms. Lisa Bino, Director for Organizational Development at CIBC First Caribbean International Bank. Professor Winston Moore, Deputy Principal of the UWI Cayfield Campus. Dr. Halima Deschamps, Senior Lecturer and Head, Institute for Gender and Development Studies at the Nita Barrow Unit. Members of the Leacock family, members of the campus community, specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. I am very happy and honored to bring you some brief remarks on behalf of the UWI Cayfield campus. As was mentioned, I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences. Now, every year on March 8th, the world observes International Women's Day, a day set aside to raise awareness of issues pertaining to women's rights, a day dedicated to celebrating the social, economic, cultural, and political achievements of women and to advocate for gender equality. It's also a day to honor the trailblazers who fought for gender equality. On this day, in this evening, I want to take a moment to reflect on the progress that has been made in this fight and the fight that still lies ahead. Uh, for too long, women were denied, and in many parts of the world continue to be denied basic human rights, opportunities, and freedoms simply because of their gender. Women are still denied access to education, health care, and economic opportunities. They are still subjected to violence and discrimination, and their voices are often silenced or ignored. But today, this month, we celebrate the courage, resilience, and achievements of women around the world who have fought tirelessly for gender justice. From the suffragettes who, suffer, who, who secured women's right to vote, to the women who fought for racial and gender equality, reproductive rights, equal pay, to the brave activists who speak out against gender-based violence and discrimination. We owe a debt of gratitude to those who came before and paved the way for this progress and to those who continue to fight. But the work is far from finished. Women continue to face discrimination, harassment, and violence in all areas of life, from the workplace to the home to the streets. Women from marginalized communities, women of color, LGBTQIA plus women, and women with disabilities face even greater barriers to equality and justice. Yet, in spite of these challenges, women continue to lead, inspire, and make their voices heard. The theme of International Women's Day 2023 is hashtag embrace equity. I find this an interesting theme because one typically associates the concept of equality with the fight for women's rights. Equality means each individual or group of people being given the same access to resources or opportunities. Equity, though, is a more nuanced concept. Equity recognizes the inherent differences that exist among individuals or groups, but that each has different circumstances and allocates the precise resources and opportunities needed to reach equal outcomes. Equity in the context of International Women's Day refers to promoting gender equality and addressing the historical and systemic barriers that prevent women from achieving their full potential in all aspects of life. It is about ensuring that women have the same opportunities, rights, and privileges as men. Audrey Lord, and I promise you, Dr. Deshong and I did not collaborate on quoting the same author, Audre Lorde, the late American writer, womanist, radical feminist, professor, civil rights activist, poet, mother, warrior, is famous for having said, 
I am not free while any woman is unfree, even when her shackles are very different from my own. And I am not free as long as one person of color remains unchained, nor is any one of you. This 19, the 1981 essay from which this quote is taken, Uses of Anger, Women Responding to Racism, explores the idea that freedom is only meaningful when it is true for all and not just a privileged few. The statement emphasizes the importance of recognizing the diversity of experiences within groups and understanding that different forms of oppression can take many different shapes. It acknowledges that the struggles for women's rights and racial justice are deeply interconnected. Now, in some contexts, equity and freedom can be seen as conflicting concepts. For example, in a capitalist society, the pursuit of individual freedom and the accumulation of wealth can often lead to inequalities and a lack of equity. However, in other contexts, equity and freedom can complement each other. For example, providing individuals with access to education and healthcare can promote equity while also enhancing their freedom by allowing them to make choices about their lives. Achieving equity for women is also not just a moral imperative, but also an economic necessity. Much research has shown that when women are given equal opportunities and access to resources, they contribute significantly to economic growth and development. More broadly for us in the Caribbean, equity is an important issue given the region's history of social and economic inequality. The legacy of colonialism and slavery created deep social and economic disparities that continue to affect the region today. Our region is vulnerable to climate change and natural disasters, which can exacerbate existing inequalities. Overall, achieving equity, embracing equity in the Caribbean, requires addressing the root causes of inequality, including historical legacies, structural barriers, and vulnerabilities to external shocks. The Institute for Gender and Development Studies, established in 1993 with units in Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, and Barbados, is critical in helping to, re to bring redress to these many issues. Through its work, the IGDS contributes to the advance advancement of gender equality and social justice by generating knowledge and promoting critical thinking on gender and development issues. It offers undergraduate and postgraduate programs in gender and development studies that equip students with a deep understanding of gender issues and how they intersect with other social, economic, and political factors. The IGDS also engages in research and advocacy on a range of issues. For example, gender-based violence, women's empowerment, gender and sexuality, gender and poverty. So on this International Women's Day, let us recommit ourselves to the fight for gender equality and equity. Let us speak out against sexism and misogyny, and stand in solidarity with women who are marginalized and oppressed. Let us work to create a world where every woman can live free from fear and discrimination, and where every girl can grow up believing that she can achieve anything she sets her mind to. Let us address the gender pay gap. Let us ensure that women have access to healthcare, education, and economic opportunities, and let us work to end violence against women. We welcome this evening's lecture by attorney at law, and author Sherry Jones. Sherry Jones, as you're well aware, authored the novel, How the One-Armed One Sister Sweeps Her House, published in 2021, and which received critical acclaim for its exploration of the complexities of life of four women in a small village in Barbados. The novel deals with issues of gender, race, class, poverty, violence, and trauma, and has been praised for its vivid writing and compelling characters. Prior to the publication of her first novel, Sherry Jones had written several short stories that were published in various literary journals and anthologies, including The Caribbean Writer, Caribbean Beat, and Iron Balloons, fiction from the Caribbean and its diaspora. She's also worked as a journalist and editor, and, has, and her writing has appeared in publications such as The Guardian, The Hub, and Electric Literature. The IGDS Nitabara Unit, and indeed the entire KPhil campus, we are delighted to once again be partnering with, with our sponsor, CIBC First Caribbean International Bank, for another installment of the International Women's Day Distinguished Lecture Series. CIBC First Caribbean remains an extremely valued partner, and we wish to publicly recognize your dedication to achieving the equality of and equity for women across all levels of society. Thank you for your continued commitment to the UWI, and we look forward to deepening our partnership for a long time to come. 
To our online and television audience, we welcome you to what is anticipated to be a critical and thoughtful lecture. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to a most interesting lecture. Good evening. And thank you, Professor Lord. Earlier this year, Barbados mourned the loss of the woman known as our First Lady of Song, the late Carolyn Leacock. Tenetry, formerly known as Vibestry, is here to pay tribute, musical tribute to this great lady. And at this stage, we pause to acknowledge again the members of Carolyn's family who have joined us this evening. Now a little bit about tem tenantry. Led by Gainon People's Choice Music Musician of the Year, Juanita Clark, this group boasts the vocals of Deronda Smith, Jalia Boyce, and Narisa Lynch, and the incomparable musicianship of Linnell Russell and Shanae Brathwaite. The group has performed at numerous events and is once again ecstatic to be part of the International Women's Day celebrations together with the Institute for Gender and Development Studies Nitabara Unit here at the University of the West Indies at Cave Hill. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, The Tenantry. Good evening, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here celebrating International Women's Day with you. And, you know, we, we discuss a lot of heavy topics all the time. We stress out, we have a lot of problems, etc. But if there's one thing I know, is that music has a way of bringing us together and uniting us and finding, you know, pleasurable ways that we can relax that we can enjoy each other. So we hope you enjoy, and we encourage you to sing along if you know the songs. Thank you. Believe I was at home when I heard. 
Now the next one is from Karen Lee, Carolyn Lee Cock. Um, God rest her soul. She was such an icon for all of us. She paved the way for all of us as musicians coming up. And these are songs we hear on the television, on the radio. So please, please relax and stay along while we celebrate her life on this day. Wind was blowing my world away from me I couldn't get nothing to stay close beside me Everything was going Some strange force to spoil all my dreams. Now great changes come over me. My tears have gone away. The sun is shining down on me, and I can feel a brand new day. I've got love and a song, and I'm right. one of my favorite songs and I am not just saying that we grew up on this song and I really want you to sing along this is one of those songs come on it is there to my heart and it has to be there to yours too no two ways about it and really just relax take some of the stress off and join in
don't want to sing alone. I need someone to sing along with me. I won't let you sing alone. Because with you is where I really want to be. If you are ready, come on over here. Come on, put your harmony with my melody. Make it so much sweeter. Puzzle harmony that you belong together. Can't you see? 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 That your melody and your harmony they go hand in hand, musical matrimony. Struck some bad notes in my child, and my song, you know, really went out of tune.
Thank you. Thank you very much, the tenantry. Ladies and gentlemen, another round of applause. A very moving tribute to a great talent who remains with us through her music. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this evening's main event. This evening's lecture is entitled Story and Solution, the Representation of Violence Against Women in Contemporary Caribbean Literature. And our featured speaker is, of course, Ms. Sherry Jones. Sherry Jones is a writer and lawyer from Barbados whose short fiction has been published in Reflex Fiction, The Feminist Wire, Pank and Eclectica, and broadcast on BBC Radio 4. She recently completed, completed her PhD in creative writing at the University of Exeter, where she was awarded a university fellowship and is an alumnus of the MA writing program at Sheffield Hallam University, where she was awarded the Archie Markham Award and the A.M. Heath Prize. She's also a 2015 Fellowship Awardee of the Vermont Studio Center. Her first novel, How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House, was shortlisted for the Women's Prize for Fiction in 2021. And the OCM, I hope I'm, I am saying this right, Bocas Prize in 2022. We at CIBC First Caribbean are very excited to have Ms. Jones address us as her book, How the One Armed Sister Sweeps Her House, was the first one discussed at our recently formed book club. And we're very pleased to welcome among the audience this evening some members of our book club. So ladies and gentlemen, we're extremely excited to welcome to the stage Ms. Sherry Jones. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Happy International Women's Day, everyone. Ms. Deborah King, Chair of Proceedings. Ms. Lisa Baino, Director of Organizational Development, CIBC First Caribbean International Bank. Professor Winston Moore, Deputy Principal, University of the West Indies. Professor Troy Lord, Dean, Faculty of Social Sciences, University of the West Indies, Cave Hill Campus. Dr. Halima Deshong, Senior Lecturer and Head, Institute for Gender and Development Studies, Nitabaro Unit, members of the Leacock family, members of the campus community, specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. I want to begin by acknowledging the ancestors on whose shoulders I stand here tonight, including Elise Lewis, Ivy Vaughn, and Clement Jones. I remember Clement especially because he is my father, because I loved and admired him, because he died only a few short months ago, because he celebrated with me last year when I completed the research which informs part of my presentation this evening, and because I know he celebrates with me tonight at the signal honor of being invited here to share some of my research findings and talk about the process of writing my novel with you. So violence against women is a pervasive social problem in the Caribbean. Former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Navi Pillay, in a statement at the end of her visit to Barbados in April 2012, is reported to have said, and I quote, Domestic violence against women and children and sexual harassment occur all over the world. However, reports suggest that there are particularly serious problems here in Barbados and in other Caribbean countries, and rape is shockingly commonplace. Despite the widespread acknowledgement of the scourge of domestic violence in the region, 
it is similarly acknowledged that legal and social responses have so far failed to arrest this problem. In a paper titled Family Violence in the Caribbean, presented to the expert group meeting on family policy development, achievements and challenges at the United Nations headquarters, New York, on 14th May, 2015, Dr. Allison Gibbons asserts that while activism, awareness and legal responses to domestic violence have increased throughout the world as a whole, and the Caribbean region in, particu in particular, excuse me, since 1975, incidents of gender-based violence seem to be growing exponentially within the English-speaking Caribbean, reaching epidemic levels within the first two decades of the 21st century. Now, Caribbean theorists have extensively explored the etiological basis of domestic violence and have variously attributed it to several factors. These include the region's colonial history of violence, entrenched traditional views of gender roles, and loss of masculinity. Despite some divergence in theory on the causes of violence, however, these theorists all seem to concede a link between the existence of domestic violence and patriarchal gender performance and positioning. positioning. Professor Bridget Burton notes as follows, for example, while the culture of violence in many respects transcended both ethnicity and gender, there is no doubt that a gender dimension is salient. Whatever its etiological premise, the gender dimension to the perpetuation and growth of violence against women in the Caribbean indicates that perhaps a cultural as opposed to a merely legal or social response to violence is warranted, a position that is supported by several regional academics and activists. So what is the role of the Caribbean novel in this? Paula Morgan and Valerie Youssef assert that imaginative participation by readers in literary texts contributes to the alteration of attitudes and opinions. They further confirm that the poetics employed are critical to this being achieved. The aim of literature is to draw readers into imaginative participation in the fictional scenario and perchance to alter attitudes and opinions by the bombardment of their senses and sensibilities. The literary devices used to induce the willing suspension of disbelief compound the impact of fiction on readers. Readers are moved by more than the bare facts, and this movement can translate into a desire to motivate and contribute to change. By extension, literature which thematically addresses domestic violence presents an opportunity for achieving transformation of national and regional attitudes to violence through meaning making which writes against domestic violence and the patriarchal gender positioning which underpins it. In examining how the Caribbean novel addressed issues of poverty, social and political disenfranchisement, selfhood and nationhood in and around the decade when many of the territories in this analysis attained, attained independence from Britain, Kamal Brathwaite separates the Caribbean novels of the 1960s into three categories. One, novels of a descriptive or narrative character that portray the reality of the Caribbean situation as is. Two, novels which reach beyond mere description of a state of affairs to imply dissatisfaction. And three, novels which suggest outlines of an alternative tradition. Brathwaite implies that the former categories are inadequate to achieve genuine social change and transformation, and further highlights as a hallmark of the third category, 
alternative poetics, which transcend the demands of conventional narrative or explanation. He therefore asserts a necessity for renegade poetics in presenting a new vision of transformative social change. Put simply, Brathwaite highlights that a critical factor in the success of story as signal for change within the Caribbean context is not merely the content of the narrative, but the way in which it is rendered, making clear that transformative novel requires revolutionary poetic, including stylistic innovation outside of the strictures of colonial language and textual forms. With reference to George Lamin's season of adventure, Brathwaite asserts that the poetics of the oppressor cannot be used to allow the reader to imagine a world outside of oppression and therefore heralds the employment of revolutionary poetics, including an alternative language and novel tradition to accomplish the vision of a new egalitarian Caribbean society. So in conducting my research, I posited that Brathwaite's categorization of 1960s narratives lends itself to an examination of modern Caribbean novels which explore domestic violence. Adopting Brathwaite's categorization, one might therefore expect Caribbean novels about domestic violence to not only embody an accurate and authentic portrayal of the reality of violence in the Caribbean, violence against women in the Caribbean, but to go beyond that to demonstrate dissatisfaction with domestic violence and the subordinate positioning of women and to suggest alternative realities for Caribbean women and the region as a whole through the employment of radical poetics, which inherently challenge patriarchal structure and approaches, including language and form outside of classical traditions and ideals. So what then are radical poetics in this context? Radical poetics are those which discard traditional methods of meaning making to subvert patriarchal, hierarchical gender positioning or performance and lend themselves to meaning making which supports equality among the sexes and decries violence against women. And so I undertook a study of selected texts by modern Anglophone Caribbean writers and explored the poetics used by those writers to address the theme of domestic violence. Defining what satisfies the designation Caribbean is just about as challenging as trying to delineate what constitutes contemporary writing. Nevertheless, for the purposes of my thesis, references to Caribbean writers signify writers from the Anglophone Caribbean those islands which share a common history of colonization, indentured labor, and a confluence of the identities and experiences of several colonizing cultures. Caribbean writers are those who were born in the region or who claim the region as origin, whether by virtue of birth or ancestry, and who, in addition, have published work which is set in the region or its diaspora. All work selected for this examination is written by writers who fit those parameters. So the selected texts were published over the period 1950 to 2021, a time span of particular interest to me because it maps the movement of several of the Anglophone territories in the Caribbean from a burgeoning pre-independence national and literary interests in shaping identity through to the present day, over half a century after several of these islands became independent. For the purposes of my research, the texts examined were grouped into two groups with reference to whether they were published before or after the 1960s. My thesis adopted a feminist reading of the selected texts to examine the extent to which concerns about domestic violence formed 
part of a pre-1960s literary thrust towards self-determination, persisted in published work throughout the next five decades, and the extent to which a thematic engagement with domestic violence remains evident today. I examined the employment of so-called radical poetics in these novels and the extent to which these poetics are applied to write against domestic violence and the gender dynamics and performances which support it and to signpost an alternative future for women. So the novels included in my analysis were Miguel Street by V.S. Naipaul, the Hills Were Joyful Together by Roger Mayes, The Lonely Londoners by Samuel Selvin, The Hills of Hebron by Sylvia Winter, In Praise of Love and Children by Beryl Gilroy, No Pain Like This Body by Harold Ladoux, Harriet's Daughter by Marlene Norbese Philip, and The Bread the Devil Need by Lisa Allen Agostini. Now, the poetics of the novels surveyed were examined with reference to, among other things, the ways in which their narrative structures manifest alternative ways of looking. Instead of the adoption of the male gaze, the so-called male gaze, and the ways in which the Caribbean oral tradition is used in opposition to patriarchal gendering. My examination explored the methods of meaning making that Caribbean writers have applied in writing about domestic violence. It questions what is the discernible impact of these poetics and examines the extent to which they demonstrate a clear objective to have a transformative impact on individual and collective attitudes to violence against women. So while an etiological examination of domestic violence was beyond the scope of, of that research. I nevertheless accepted that domestic violence is grounded in and supported by patriarchal performances of gender, that literature plays a decisive role in social change, and that narratives utilizing radical poetics, which subvert and interrogate patriarchal gender positioning, are required to achieve transformative social change in our understanding of and attitudes to domestic violence. I therefore examine how modern Caribbean writers have contributed to the discourse on, on violence against women through the poetics employed in the selected texts. I also examine the creative process undertaken and the poetics employed in thematically addressing domestic violence in my own novel, How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House thereby placing this novel within the modern Caribbean literary discourse on violence against women. So what did my research reveal and how did it inform and impact my own writing and vice versa? Well, my research revealed a general preeminence of themes of nationhood in the novels published in the 1950s and 60s and subordination of thematic treatment of women's concerns, including domestic violence, in the novels surveyed. While there is evidence of engagement of radical poetics in novels from this period, their discernible object would generally appear to be concerns of disenfranchisement of a poor black underclass and the realization of a nationhood which mirrors colonial society in its patriarchal structure and resulting subordination of women. My study suggested a prominence in the employment of the male gaze in the earlier novels examined, but it also revealed a movement towards the employment of alternative ways of looking in later Caribbean literary discourse. It also suggests a continuing, continuing oral tradition whose focus has moved away from only nationalist concerns of empire to address the role, position, and oppression of women through violence. So I considered the ways in which modern Caribbean writing on domestic violence, as exemplified in the novel survey, demonstrates an evolution of approach that transcends the male gaze to employ alternative ways of looking. 
I attribute the adoption of the male gaze in the work of pre-independence narratives like The Hills Were Joyful Together and The Lonely Londoners to a literary tradition which had its genesis in the adaptation of that of the classical English novel tradition and focus on elevating the people and concerns of the black socially disenfranchised underclass to the subject of an emerging literary canon modeled on that of the colonizers. This resulted in new narratives of Caribbean nationhood reflecting the same systemic prejudices against women that characterize their Western counterparts. These narratives generally fail to perceive and relay any alternative reality for women, a fact I link to their poetics. This narrative bias against women persists even in the novels of that period by female authors like Winter and Gilroy, whose work similarly did not imagine, in my opinion, the required, did not imagine, did not reimagine what was required to resolve problematic social positioning of women. My research in my research, I argue that even though Naipaul's Miguel Street might be viewed as unique among the pre-independence novels in that it does not so obviously replicate the male gaze evidence in some of its contemporaries, it fails to move past the suggestion of an alternative way of looking to herald a definitive roadmap for positive change. This is to be contrasted with post-1960s narratives by Alan Agostini and Ledoux, for example, who appear to discard the objectification of women and voyeuristic depictions of violence to suggest alternative ways of looking that give primacy to a female perspective, rehumanize female victims, and focus an empathetic lens on victims of domestic violence choosing to describe the impact of violence on the individual and community psyche, rather than to glorify the violent act in and of itself. So my research would also have focused on Naipaul's employment of the Calypso poetic in Miguel Street, exploring his employment of the oral tradition in this narrative as a revolutionary structural device used to undermine the patriarchal social system which supports domestic violence. However, my research distinguishes the facility and focus with which Naipaul employs the Calypso poetic to highlight the fallacies inherent in prevailing gender hierarchy from the approaches of Mace and Selvan, the form of whom fails to fully integrate Orcher within the narrative structure. My research does not, however, suggest that Naipaul's employment of the Calypso poetic is targeted at changing the social reality for women, for Caribbean women. Rather, his use of the Calypso poetic by the very nature of the art form reveals the paradox between patriarchal gender positioning and values and the reality of life for many Caribbean women. In so doing, Naipaul is effective at highlighting the fallacy of the superordination of the male and dismantling the tropes about some of the tropes about the Caribbean woman. But he is not as effective in highlighting what alternative social order is to be imagined and pursued. In contrast, the more recent Anglophone Caribbean narratives which I examined address violence against women and appear to employ especially the performative element of the oral tradition in crafting a poetics of horror which mimics the unsettlement experienced by victims of violence. Readers are forced into a more immediate engagement with this story with the replication of oral elements of the story requiring, in some cases, unforeseen switching of sensory engagement with the text. Further, Alan Agostini's very recent narrative employs the musicality, paradoxical meaning-making, and use of 
so-called nonsense words, characteristic of the Calypso poetic, to offer a glimpse of an alternative future. So of particular interest to me was the way in which representations of community in recent post-independent narratives interrogate the traditional superordination of community cohesion in upholding patriarchal values over the hearing and healing of victims of violence. These narratives subvert the status quo by questioning the relevance and importance of established community values such as the sacredness of Judeo-Christian religion, which appear to support a patriarchal value system. Narratives by Alan Agostini and Ladue undermine the notion that patriarchal positioning is sacrosanct, supported by an unquestionable God, and therefore to be endured by female victims of violence. Rather, these texts question the goodness and relevance of God and do so in a way that suggests that a faith which supports the subordination of women is no faith for women. In my own novel, in acknowledgement of the relational importance of community in building identity, the community is made character, embodying a singular voice which highlights the ostracism of female victims of violence while questioning the relevance of the identification with any collective which would perpetuate it. I identify the concept of community as a possibility for further creative engagement in my own work. So time does not permit me to present and discuss my findings in the detail I would perhaps want to. Um, but I'm happy to provide additional information to anyone who wants to talk to me about it after. Um, so my research is both practice-led and practice-based. And tonight I want to focus a little on how some of the novels I examined exempl exemplified a departure from the so-called male gaze and experimentation with different, and demonstrate experimentation with different ways of looking. And I want to turn a little bit to the impact of my research in this regard on the crafting of my own novel, How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House. So 20th century literary theorists have explored the pervasiveness in contemporary culture, including literature, of the male gaze. A, toy, a term coined by Laurel Mulvey to signify the narrative or cinematic reflection of patriarchal, heteronormative gender ideals, which place the male in a position of power and relay and define the world story with prim primacy being given to his perspective. The male gaze is therefore a way of seeing, interpreting, and engaging, which perpetuates the subordination of women promotes the exercise of absolute male power and undergirds a system which supports domestic violence. Now the attribution of the term male to this way of looking is admittedly problematic because it smacks of the very essentialism it rightly problematizes, a difficulty acknowledged by several theorists. Nevertheless, it is used here as it is generally understood to signify the way in which the narratives surveyed demonstrate phallocentricity and to assess the extent to which they interrogate it. Now, specifically in looking at the male gaze and alternative ways of looking, I examined the ways in which some of the texts that I surveyed demonstrated scopophilic traits in the rendering of violent acts against women, ascribe narrative primacy to the male perspective, and manifest objectification of women generally, and intranarrative ostracism of women who either do not subscribe to the primacy of the male viewpoint or cannot demonstrate value to the male within its strictures that several pre-independence Caribbean narratives inhabited the male gaze in storytelling 
is often attributed to the modeling of the post-colonial Caribbean literary tradition on that of its former colonizers. Now the phallocentricity of these texts is reflected to a greater or lesser degree in their narrative treatment of violence against women and the poetics employed in writing about violence, most notably the absence of discernible attempts to write against it. Now here I want to just refer to, to one of the texts that I found particularly interesting, and this is The Hills Were Joyful Together by Roger Mayus. And I read The Hills Were Joyful Together and paid particular attention to how the violent incidents in the text relayed with little to no relayed domestic violence with little to no narrative space allocated to the psychic damage to the female victim of the violent act or to the wider community. The narrative effect of this technique is to minimize the trauma suffered by the female victim of violence and to inspire an almost pathological fascination and desensitization in the reader to the impact of the violent act on the vi victim, engendering instead a distracting curiosity about the spectacle of the act itself, dehumanizing both reader and narrative victim, and leading to tolerance instead of transformation. So in this novel, when Shag relays a story about his friend, Wallace C., who killed his girlfriend after he, she, after he discovered that she was cheating on him, for example. The circumstances of her death are told in voyeuristic detail. And in the telling, she is rendered voiceless, not even attributed a single sound of protest. So I'm going to read an extract from that novel now. And Wallace reached under the mattress where he kept his machete sharp and chopped up Susu like cuts of meat. First, he chopped her head off and then the rest of her he chunked up. And he did it so quick and businesslike like nobody in the apartment house even hear a sound. Near the end of the novel, Euphemia is also murdered by her lover for infidelity. And again, the killing is relayed in gory detail without reference to the trauma of the victim. Shag was standing over her with the machete raised aloft. It was stained with blood. She put up her hands as though to ward off the blow. Three fingers were shorn off clean. They fell into her lap. She screamed again, long and high-pitched. And that was the last time. The very next blow severed her windpipe. And the point of the machete traveled diagonally in a straight line across her right breast. But she was still alive. And her eyes stared up at him in horror as he slashed and slashed at her with the machete. One blow locked off, locked off the left arm clean above the elbow. I'm soon going to stop. And laid her abdomen open. Her entrails spilled out upon her lap. Now tellings of this sort, devoid of any reference to the feeling and anguish of the victim of the violent act or any meaningful indication of protest or resistance by that victim. Do little to imply dissatisfaction with the status quo as it relates to violence against women or to contribute to the transformation in cultural attitudes to domestic violence. This narrative inhabitation of the male gaze is consistent across all renderings of violent episodes in Mayes novel, including those against men and might at first suggest a poetics of violence which is unconcerned with the gender of the victim. Near the beginning of the novel, for example, 
Maeus describes a fight between Manny and Euphemia, started when Manny is rude to her. Now in that fight, the female is the aggressor, and the narrative account includes the following. Two long whales lumped up and redden at his side. Her other hand with the heavy gold ring she wore for shag cut his top lip so that the two axe teeth in front showed through, pinning the lip stiff against his face. Similarly, the male-on-male -male ambush of flitters for betraying Sir Jew is an equally graphic rendering of physical carnage. Crawfish stabbed him in the side of the face with his knife. The point of the blade went in just below the eye. It laid his cheek open to the bone, came to a jarring stop against the teeth in his lower jaw. The knife struck him again in the neck and sheer through the juggler. The point came out through the other side of his throat. However, the fallacy of equality in narrative treatment of violence, irrespective of the gender of the victim, is exposed on closer examination. The difference in narrative treatment of violence against women and violence against and among men in that text is that the text allows the omniscient narrator to inhabit the mind and perspective of the male victim, allowing him a fight and a protest that make him equal in humanity to the aggressor, irrespective of the outcome, rather than a mute object of violence. In the depiction of Flitter's murder reference above, for example, Flitter's resistance is rendered over several pages and includes the following. He had nothing to fight back at them with but his fists. His breath came from him with a hoarse, rasping sob, but he was fighting with the bitter end of that berserk rage. He hit out blindly with both fists, his breath jerking from him with those big, rasping sobs. The violent incidents against women in the novel generally do not afford the reader a similar excursion into the sentiment and emotion of the female victim of violence, making it difficult to find evidence of an implied empathy for her or disapproval of the act of violence against the female, far less evidence of a transformative vision. Mayer's depiction suggests a lack of narrative intent to foreground domestic violence or prescribe an alternative. Rather, the narrative representation simultaneously presents violence as an explicit source of pleasure to the reader and a performance in which the female victim is objectified and silenced and the male victim is presented as a present, powerful, an active opponent. So in producing a narrative which appears to so fully inhabit the male gaze in describing the violent act itself, how the hills were joyful together fails to interrogate the patriarchal model of masculinity undergirding domestic violence or to suggest that the ideal society should reject it. Yet, the survey suggests that it would be an error to regard such renderings of violence to be characteristic of all the pre-1960s narratives examined as part of my research, including those written by women. In Gilroy's In Praise of Love and Children, for example, there is no voyeuristic pleasure evident in the rendering of Arnie's beating of his girlfriend, Trudy which is almost cold in its matter of factness. He slapped her hard. She and the baby both shrieked again. She took a jug and threw it at Arnie. It shattered at his feet. Yet, far from a discernible narrative effort to write against domestic violence, there is evidence of narrative complicity in the implied appropriateness of this beating when the narrator suggests that it is brought on by Trudy's attempts to make a batiman of Arnie's son, and I'm quoting, and her relentless te tendency to defy, to defy her partner's authority. Similarly, in the hills of Hebron, 
the rape which resolves one of the dramatic tensions central to the story is relayed in a manner which, though not graphic, perpetuates the objectification of the victim, depicting the victim's protest as obliterated by the sound within the male aggressor's head and suggesting that the victim arches her body towards that of the rapist after the act. So no, I'm not going to um, read that extract. Similarly, the rendering of violent acts in the hills were joyful together is to be contrasted with Salvin's referential narration of wife beating in the lonely Londoners and Naipaul's employment of what may be called the poetics of omission in his contemporaneous Miguel Street. Naipaul and Selvin, Selvin omit the details of the physical battle altogether, with their narratives addressing occurrences of beating only after the fact or elusively. Lewis beating his wife in the Lonely Londoners, for example, is rendered without descriptive detail. And I'll quote, and as soon as he get home, he start beating up Agnes, even though the poor girl don't know what for. Similarly, Tony's beatings of Miss Herrera in Miguel Street are relayed almost through a veil. Then the beatings began, I'm quoting from the text. The woman used to run out screaming. We would hear the terrible dog barking and we would hear the man shouting and cursing and using language so coarse that we were all shocked. This shifts the reader's focus from the gore of the act itself to its impact on the wider community. The terror of the beaten woman, the shock of the neighbors, the fact that even the dog, who has no capacity to reason, is discombobulated by the trauma of the event. In this way, the text accomplishes not only the reflection of the reality of violence against women, but its impact on the wider community in which they live, thereby interrogating this impact on the collective psyche and forcing the reader to question its relevance. In fact, Miguel Street elevates this performance to the realm of the surreal and uses a subversive humor in relaying some incidents of violence against women in George and the Pink House, for example, this is from Miguel Street, the narrator observes, he had his wife and his daughter and his son. He beat them all. And when the boy Elias grew too big, George beat his daughter and his wife more than ever. The blows didn't appear to do the mother any good. She just grew thinner and thinner. But the daughter, Dolly, thrived on it. She grew fatter and fatter and giggled more and more every year. Naipaul's representation therefore more clearly interrogates the reality of domestic violence and suggests an inadequacy of traditional descriptive narration to capture the horror, horror of the violent act. By elevating the performance of violence to the realm of the freakishly funny, and incomprehensibly absurd, he forces reader engagement with the text in a way that calls into question the place of domestic violence in Caribbean sociocultural realities, highlights pathos, and implies dissatisfaction. Miguel Street therefore meets the requirements of Brathwaite's second category of assessment. In the novels surveyed from the post 1960s period, there is clear evidence of a movement from gratuitous relays of violent acts and evolution of a poetics of omission in narrative representations of violence. In Harold Sonny Ledoux's No Pain Like This Body, for example, several of the descriptions of violence rendered from the perspective of the child narrator. While relatively detailed, are almost cartoonish in their simplicity and therefore more tragic in their significance and narrative import. And I'll read a short extract um, from No Pain Like This Body. Pa hated Ma, so he picked up Ma as if he was picking up a little child and he held her in the air. 
Ma ball like a cow, hard, hard, hard. Ma didn't want to go inside the tub. She was turning and twisting as a worm, just turning and twisting and bawling, just bawling and trying to get away. The water in the tub was full of soap suds. Pa held her high and he held her tight. So in writing How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House, it was important for me to achieve a narrative balance between authentically portraying the horror and trauma intrinsic to the lived reality of so many female victims of domestic violence and not engaging in gratuitous renderings of the violent act itself. For me, my sense of responsibility and my understanding of this story demanded the employment of an alternative way of looking, including what I considered to be appropriate depictions of the violent acts endured by many of the women in the novel. There is therefore no voyeuristic depiction of violence in how the one-armed sister sweeps her house. In chapter 27, for example, when Lala interrupts Aiden while he is praying before a robbery and suffers his violence as a result, there is no gratuitous, grisly description of the act or the injury. The impact is shown on other inanimate objects reminiscent of Naipaul's poetic of omission. And I'm reading an extract now from How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House, short one. Lala sighs without thinking. She makes a loud sound that reminds her of tearing paper. She watches Aiden's lips stop their caress of David's words, and she sighs loudly again for a different reason. She watches her hand jerk, sees the cup fall, the rice scatter, watches the pages of the Bible flutter, sees the Psalms of David submerged. In other accounts, violent incidents are not only not described in physical detail, but are relayed in an almost hypothetical manner, as if we are uncertain whether the incident actually took place at all. And again, I'll read an extract. In this other world, Lala imagines, coconut trees do not exist, neither do centipedes, nor men who hold your right hand so tightly you could wet yourself. There is a physical state beyond pain, a sort of numbness that allows Lala to remain standing while the flesh and bones of her right hand are forced upwards so that her wrist looks like it is wrapped in bracelets of warm red. In her mind, her bones break with the explosive pop pop of fireworks. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. But at first she is screaming and then she is in such pain that she is not. So this poetics of omission is manifest in Lisa Allen Agostini's novel also. This is the bread the devil need, need. Where violent incidents against women are relayed without the explicit detail of the act itself and more emphasis is placed on its impact on the victim. I'm reading a short extract. I take one sip. The mobby was bitter. I skin up my face before I could control the expression. I know he see. I try to set the glass exactly in the ring of water that sure will Leo first put it down for me. Just so. The plate, the glass, and my face went flying to the floor. Callaloo was dripping from my hair. I had mobby in my eye. So while not all of the pre-1960s texts examine, demonstrate scopophilia in representations of violence against women, they all appear to reflect the narrative primacy of the male perspective and, the marginaliz and marginalization of the female. In the Yard Society of the Hills Were Joyful Together, for example, this is accomplished in a number of ways, not only by the telling of the story from an overwhelmingly male perspective, 
but also by the intratext marginalization and oppression of the female characters and a series of textual images and references that relay and reinforce this marginalization. In one scene near the start of the novel, Rima comes home from a hard day's work to the image of her boyfriend, Serju, sprawled across the middle of their bed where he has been all day, forcing her to inhabit a small space on the side of the bed and begging him to move over a bit so she, tired, can rest. This image visually translates the position of women in yard society of the time, a beast of burden of only peripheral importance. Within this text, this gender positioning is reinforced in a number of ways, including textual references to the supremacy of an unwritten male code, which all characters, male and female, seem to understand and accept. When Serju, in prison, for example, holds a number of guards hostage, the superintendent of the prison seeks to solve the impasse with a promise of fairness and appeal to this very same code, which works in placating the prisoner and which is expressed to be a higher ideal than even the law the superintendent is bound to administer and enforce. Listen, man. I give you my word in the presence of all of these officers and prisoners that I will give you a fair hearing and a square deal. Not according to the book, either. As man to man. All right. So in Naipaul's first chapter, he acknowledges the imitative value of American phallocentricity with his references to the film Casablanca. I don't know if you remember the year the film Casablanca was made. That was the year when Bogart's frame, fame spread like fire through Port of Spain and hundreds of young men began adopting the hard-boiled Bogartian attitude Yet the eponymous Bogart of the chapter is arrested on a charge of bigamy, which the narrator suggests is the result of a broken heart over the inability of his first wife to bear children. When Eddowes questions why Bogart left that wife, Hat responds to be a man among we men in a way that inspires empathy and suggests to the young narrator and to the reader that the Bogart braggadocio is unfulfilling. Of the more recently published narratives surveyed, Norbese Phillips appears to write most obviously in direct opposition to the employment of the male gaze in a narrative which overtly superordinates the female perspective, thereby boldly rejecting phallocentricity. Her young female narrator overtly questions patriarchal gender positioning, which is evident all around her. And I'm reading from page 34. How come he, I asked, pointing to my brother, never gets to do any work around here? I don't see my name on these dishes or on this floor. His hands don't seem broken to me. My mother told me to shut up, that he was a boy and that he had better things to do. Like what, I said. In Harriet's Daughter, which is the novel um, I read that extract from, it is the female characters who are given complexity and depth in intratextual interaction, with the male ca characters retaining peripher peripheral yet ominous roles in the narrative drama. This is arguably a less successful route to Brathwaite's third category. And Harriet's daughter, perhaps surprisingly, does not quite achieve the status of transformative texts. For all their intelligence and sensitivity, the female characters remain constrained indeed by the specter of their husband's power. The fisher and the male-female relationship is never reconciled or resolved. And some of the female characters who appeal to the female protagonist 
seem to be value for characteristics which harken back to traditional performances of gender, including attributions of softness, affection, and household skills to the feminine. And I'll read a, a quick line from page 54. Hugging Mrs. B was like hugging a great big soft pillow. She held me close for a minute or so, and I could smell her clean, flowery smell. Moreover, we get no glimpse of alternative imagined gender positioning or performance based on equality in the diasporic Caribbean. In approaching a more feminist-centric rendering in my own novel, I considered having this story told as a testimonial narrative in the first person. However, I encountered problems linked to the gap between story and reality. The reality is that survivors of domestic violence are often voiceless. Their experiences can cause, over time, a literal and connotative loss of voice and a heightened sense of fear caused by post-traumatic stress. I had to fight to find a way to make the story unquestionably Lala's story while reflecting her lack of agency in telling it, which is generally the case in real life. Early drafts of the novel were therefore written in the first person from Lala's point of view, but this was creatively problematic for several reasons. Firstly, it allowed Lala an agency and vocal power not supported by real life accounts and which could therefore undermine the authenticity of the narrative. Secondly, the truth is that many survivors are so traumatized by their experiences as to be stuck in patterns of unhelpful rumination in their retelling, or to demonstrate dissociation in other ways, which could negatively impact pacing, as well as elevate Lala's unreliability as a narrator to the point that the reader could have found it difficult to identify with her. For example, in earlier drafts, Lala repeatedly ruminated on the incident that resulted in the death of her baby. In those early drafts, baby's death was portrayed over several chapters, which always involved Lala retelling the incident with additional details added or removed, by which the reader was expected to approximate what had actually happened on the night that baby was killed and who was at fault for her death. However, while the repeated rumination on the incident might have been authentic, and consistent with the real and expected psychological trauma of the abuse suffered, to include it in the narrative in this way would have negatively impacted the pacing of the novel in a manner that was difficult to alleviate through other means. I therefore changed the point of view to that of a limited omniscient narrator in third person and generally made this the same for all main characters. The inadequacy of traditional linear storytelling for the telling of stories about violence against women was true for me in writing this novel. A simple third person account felt, some, felt somehow insufficient in the rendering of this story, inadequate to truly represent the horror of the violence suffered by Lala. Further, a heightened level of empathy was required to ensure reader identification with the characters in the novel, especially Lala, that I felt would not be adequately addressed by the distance afforded by a simple third person rendering, which allowed for the illusion, illusion of separation between a woman in Lala's circumstances and the wider community, including the reader, and perhaps a resulting tendency to judge or to blame Lala. At the same time, while I wanted the reader to identify with Lala and to empathize with her, I did not want the reader to over-identify with Lala to such an extent that they would not be, un be able to appreciate Aiden's character, for example, and by extension, to appreciate the fact that many abusers were themselves abused at one point or another. Dominic LeCapra's ideal of achieving empathetic unsettlement in the reader, for example, um, Sorry, Le Capra's ideal of achieving empathetic in settlement in the reader was therefore a consideration for me 
when making creative choices about the narrative point of view and the telling of this story gen generally. I eventually chose to tell this story using a number of points of view. So for example, chapter one starts with a third person account of the birth of baby and the narrator follows Lala through the harrowing circumstances surrounding that birth. By chapter three, however, the narration has shifted to second person and the use of the pronoun you becomes an invocation to the reader to inhabit the action in the story while sim simultaneously being evocative of the dissociation Lala suffers as a result of the trauma of the violence she suffers at her husband's hands. And I'll read an extract from page 27. Even now, with baby sleeping open mouth between the two of you, when you're reassured of reality by the chirping of birds, the swish of coconut leaves, and the roar and retreat of the waves below, even now, you can look into the face of the man snoring on the other side of that small baby and wonder who he is. You can see those thin, spiteful lips slackened into pleasantry by sleep and forget how they feel when he kisses you. I felt that the structure of the novel had to allow the reader to experience firsthand not necessarily the gruesome acts of violence that Lala endures, but the psychological trauma, community alienation, hypervigilance, and stress suffered by Lala and by extension, other victims of violence. Switching points of view in telling this story helped to establish that sense of dislocation, alienation, and distortion of reality suffered by female victims of violence, as the reader also endures a series of foundational shifts in narrative which mirror the fundamental shifts in experience and understanding of reality, which Lala would have suffered as a result of the violence meted out to her. The novel therefore slips in and out of a variety of other points of view and perspectives, including first person, plural, a point of view rarely employed in traditional novels, from the point of view of the village in which Lala lives. This rendering highlights Lala's alienation from the village collective, an alienation which is mirrored in the narrative. I'll read a short extract. Had we not been aware that she was wedded to another man, we might have told her. We would have taken this tone for her husband. Were we not aware that this tone sells his body to the tourist women on the beach, we would believe that this body is hers. So studiously does she avoid devouring it with her eyes in the way that her client cannot help do. But this is not before the death of Lala's baby. This is after. This is a time when we do not talk to Lala, when our good hawkers hesitate to refer tourists in need of braids and beading, although we know she is our best. So Miguel Street makes it clear that it is the women who support their families and are otherwise generally the backbone of home and community life. Mayus does also reflect the complexity of gender positioning in the yard community and the matrifocality of wider Caribbean society for, by demonstrating, for example, the fact that within the relationship between Serju and Rima, Rima is the one who works and earns to support him and their household, despite Serju's bragging to the contrary. Further, she is the one who intuits first that Flitters is not to be trusted. However, this apparent wisdom is not maintained when Flitters eventually betrays Serju, causing Serju to be jailed as a result of a botched robbery. At that point, Rima is portrayed as losing her mind, as if the narrative suggests that she is hopeless and rudderless without her man. The woman of Mayus Yard remains an inanimate object, defined by her sexual appeal and devoid of the aspiration to self-actualize that is the aim of all humanity. 
Ditty's character in is particularly interesting in this respect. She is hypersexualized, her actions often absent of apparent motive, and her stated sexual desire devalued by its lack of depth. She appears to seek the sexual favors of several male characters with no rhyme, reason, or rationale to her choices. Narrative references to her character focus on her physical appearance. Mayus describes Ditty as follows. Ditty gave him a warm smile, got up, walked slowly across the yard. Something in her face, the shape of her mouth, her eyes, the way she carried herself, exuding sex like a warm, pungent odor, like some over-scented flower. Every time she looked at a man, she was just asking to be laid. Other female characters receive similar narrative treatment, save for the religious and the older woman. Female characters are generally described with reference to their visual appeal to males or to their sexuality and the older females not so described are presented as understanding that their age or religion or both make them undesirable or less worthy of male attention, which attention is therefore understood to be prized among females. On confronting her husband about an open act of infidelity with a younger woman, the mature Charlotta asserts, I only want for things to go right, but I'm an old foul now. Chicken is what you want. The women of Mace Yard generally have no agency over their sexuality. Sex is a demonstration of power by the male performed on the body of the female, who is portrayed as passive recipient to be chased and conquered. In the pre-1960s novels, women who own their sexuality are therefore marginalized on the fringes of the community within the narratives examined, often irredeemably so. Laura from the Miguel Street, Ditty and Zephyr from the Hills Were Joyful Together, and Trudy in Gilroy's In Praise of Love and Children are examples of this estrangement from community after demonstration of sexual agency. In contrast, the modern day woman of Lisa Allen Agostini's The Bread the Devil Need reflects a changed sexual dynamic where woman is both the object of sexual power as well as its savvy practitioner embodied in the main female protagonist who maintains the central focus and narrative voice of the text. In How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House, it was also important for me to interrogate the traditional gender stereotyping, which has been accepted as fundamental to the existence of violence against women in the Caribbean. I was specifically interesting, interested in exploring the trope of woman as either shameless whore, thief, liar, or on the other hand, mother, virgin, or saint. I believe that women must be portrayed as the complex, flawed human beings we all are, irrespective of gender. Women must be portrayed as deserving of respect and love, despite our human flaws, not because such a portrayal contradicts current scripting, but because such a portrayal is true. And truth is the only foundation upon which transformational change can take place. The whores in my book are therefore both female, Queen of Sheba and Mira, and male, Tone. It is a man, Aiden, who steals from a woman, Lala, in the context of a romantic relationship. And Tone's interest in and love for Lala transcends physical appearance. He is depicted as being moved by Lala's inner qualities and not her physical appearance, which is hardly described at all. Similarly, Tone is Lala's lover, although she is already married to Aiden. In accordance with colonial ideals, this might have sub subjected Lala to condemn condemnation and censure. However, 
It was important to me that the narrative manifests an empathetic rendering of that of fear, that it questioned the idea of romantic love, and that a man, as man, can demonstrate transcendental love for a flawed female character by not only assisting her escape from Baxter's Beach, but also by being willing to take the blame for the death of her baby so that she could be free. My research suggests that the texts in which the adoption of the male gaze was manifest were of less transformative value in addressing domestic violence. However, this appeared to also hold true for the one novel surveyed which clearly and directly superordinated feminocentric concerns. My analysis showed that the time of publication was not determinative of the likelihood of narrative inhabitation of the male gaze as Miguel Street, in contrast to the other early texts examined, employed an alternative way of looking that promoted empathy for the plight of abused women, although it fell, arguably fell short of scripting an alternative reality. So within the novels explored, the only narrative solutions proffered to resolve oppression and abuse would appear to be those which demonstrate within the text separation of the abused female self from communities which, through endorsement of patriarchal values or otherwise, support abuse. This separation might be forced or voluntary, physical by a departure or death like Euphemia in the hills of Hebron or Trudy in In Praise of Love and Children, or psychic loss of sanity, for example, as ha happened to the character of Ma in No Pain Like This Body. But the fissure is represented as inevitable. In the narratives examined, the abused female appears to often suffer first physical violence and then the psychological violence of separation. This certainly was true for my own novel. The chapter within which Sergeant Beckles interrogates Lala about what role she might have played in the death of her baby is written from the perspective of the community and highlights Lala's marginalization within it. The inaction of this community its complicit observation of her suffering generally, and while she is questioned, leaves Lala no apparent choice but to leave it, which she does at the end of the novel when she transcends the reach even of the text. The reader is left to surmise that she is safely inside of an airplane, which Tone observes lifting into the sky. In How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House, there is therefore no reconciliation at the level of community. Lala is forced to reject the collective which nurtured her in the interests of her own safety. The narrative may suggest that the only option for self-healing for the abused woman is to reject the community from which she is already marginalized and possibly ostracized. An option for future creative projects may be to imagine reconciliation and reintegration for victims of abuse at the community level, a possibility Lisa Allen Agostini has already started to creatively explore in The Bread the Devil Needs. In Allen Agostini's narrative, uh, there is a more optimistic ending, demonstrating healing and reconciliation through the support and attention of a therapeutic community and a wider collective intolerance of domestic violence, heralding a bold excursion into the imagined future Brathwaite's third category advocates. In ending, I'd like to read a bit from my book and specifically from what I consider to be one of the more wrenching part of the story. It occurs at the point where Lala and Aiden are fighting for possession of their child. Now, if you, have, if you haven't yet um, read How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House, 
the book is about a young woman called Lala. And on the when we meet Lala at the beginning of the novel, she is just about to give birth to her baby. Her husband is nowhere to be found. Her husband, Aiden, is a career criminal. And on the same night that her baby is born, there is a murder which takes place further along the beach of a wealthy white tourist. The story, How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House, is really about how those two events are connected, the birth of Lala's baby and the murder of this tourist. And in exploring that connection, it looks at several issues um, in contemporary Barbadian society. So let me just read the extract to end. So as I said, this, this extract occurs at the point in the novel where Aiden and Lala are fighting to hold their baby. When Jacinth reaches out to take baby from Aiden, to join him in hugging and holding and cooing over how beautiful she is, Lala strides over and says, she must feed baby first. It is past time for her feeding. She lifts baby from Aiden's hands before he can respond, straighten baby's pale yellow smocked dress and obscures her navel again. The baby, startled by the sudden loss of admiration and the sound and sight of her father's fawning, threatens a cry, but Lala pays no heed. Perhaps it is the tenderness with which Aiden retrieves baby from her arms before she can fetch the bottle and proffers her again to Jacinth. Perhaps it is the maternal madness that epilogues a recent birth. Perhaps it is that they're both a little house mad from being locked inside. Aiden in the tunnels and Lala with baby because they have to be careful. They cannot afford for Aiden to be seen. Perhaps it is everything that came before it or nothing in particular, but whatever it is that makes Lala not understand what she is starting, it is a costly deficit. Everything deteriorates. Aiden lowers his eyes from Jacinth's, but does not look at Lala. He looks at the ground as the sound is sucked out of the room. Give me back, baby, is what he says to Lala. I go feed she, Lala protests. Tone stops squeezing his locks, closes the window against the rain. It getting ready to clear up, he says. We gone here, Aiden. Go get this girl home before it come down properly. Give me back, baby, Aiden insists. Jacinth jumps up, relieved to have received the signal from Tone to go. She says to Aiden, it's okay. She will come out and visit some other time. She will see baby again then. Let her have her fee. She look hungry and true. It's okay, Aiden. Lala holds baby closer, feels her stiffen and start to claw, refusing to be drawn into her own mother's bosom. Aiden, insistent, tugs baby back while sucking his teeth. A custard-colored booty falls onto the hard wood floor and does not bounce. Aiden is holding onto a little naked foot. Baby wails again. Aiden is twisting the baby's legs away from Lala. Jacinth is heading towards the door. Tone is approaching Lala and Aiden as they start to move with the baby suspended between them. Lala reclaims both legs. Aiden moves his big, big hands to baby's torso and tries to lift the baby out of Lala's arms. Jacinth has reached the door, is putting on her sandals. Tone stands behind her, takes up most of the space in the doorway, keeps the light out, blocks the sight of Aiden and Lala struggling over baby. Thunder grumbles and barks. Baby jumps and both parents realize at once that this right of possession is scaring her. Neither wishes to scare her. Perhaps this is why Lala lets go of the little legs at the precise moment that Aiden lets go of her torso and baby plummets to the floor in a flailing plumage of pale yellow and chocolate and lands with a soft 
thump and is silent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Jones. We had allocated a few minutes for uh, a couple questions. Uh, we recognize that we're running a little over. If there are any burning questions, um, please pose them now, or we can continue this discussion over a few drinks after. Thank you. Um, I'm going to invite to the stage just to close out our proceedings for us, Dr. Tonya Haynes from the Institute for Gender and Development Studies, Nitabara Unit, to say a few words of thanks. Um, thank you so much, Chair. Um, featured speaker, Dr. Sherry Jones. Um, Ms. Lisa Bino, Director in Organizational Development, CIBC First Caribbean International Bank. Professor Winston Moore, Deputy Principal of the Cato Campus. Professor Troy Lord, Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences. Dr. Hallam Adeshong, Senior Lecturer and Head at the Institute for Gender and Development Studies, Nita Barry Unit. Members of the Leacock family also want to um, acknowledge as well members of Sherry Jones's family, whom I met um, earlier tonight, members of the campus community, specially invited guests, and all of you who are gathered here tonight. Um, it is my sincere pleasure to move the vote of thanks. I am Dr. Tanya Haynes, lecturer at the Institute for Gender and Development Studies. And, you know, I was just absolutely delighted when Sherry Jones agreed to deliver this lecture here on International Women's Day. It was for me, you know, a, a sincere honor, um, to, you know, to have Sherry Jones here tonight. And I really want to thank you for the very powerful and moving work that you did. One of the things I was reflecting on recently is that academic language through its abstraction is very often so far removed from the emotion and the feeling, especially around violence. So you can get invited as somebody working in gender studies over and over and over to talk about violence against women, to talk about um, violence against girls, and you're able to do it without falling apart because you have a language of abstraction that is about four degrees um, removed from sentiment. And so for me, it was very powerful to hear you talk about being a writer and the creative process of doing practice-led and practice-based um, research and, you know, writing about these things. And Saidia Hartman, in a different context, but she asked a question that I think is important to reflect on when you're writing about violence. How does one revisit the scene of subjection without replicating the grammar of violence? And so for me, this exploration that you took us through different contemporary Caribbean novels and the thinking about the possibilities of transformation in the novel and in broader creative work, but also the way that that writing about violence um, can compromise or retreat from, or not even consider those um, transformative possibilities of creative work. And so for me, that was among a range of other things, and I have some very sort of scattered notes, and I was assuming that I would you know, gather them together while the Q&A was happening so I could sound a lot more coherent. But I do really want to thank you so much for what you have offered to us here tonight. Um, you know, truly a, a lot to think about. And when we do our work, we always have artists in this space. So it was a delight as well to have um, the tenantry perform. They've performed for us at many of our events. And I, you know, I want to really see the only all women band in Barbados go on much bigger stages. So thank you to them for what they did and what they offered um, in tribute to Carolyn Leacott as well. And a big thank you for her family for giving us their blessing in having this tribute as well. 
Um, now I want to thank our partners. I was going to say sponsors, but I feel like we really are partners um, with First Caribbean CIBC International Bank. So to have so many um, members of the bank staff, to have the, the book club from the bank come out, but also a sincere pleasure every year to work with Chantal and Anthony in planning and putting this together. So I really want to um, commend CIBC First Caribbean International Bank for their partnership with the UWI and for what they do that is extra special with the Nita Barra unit. We really appreciate it. Um, an event like this does not take place without a lot of hard work and planning behind the scenes. So I really want to extend sincere gratitude to the hard, very hardworking team at the Nita Barra unit. I also want to recognize Mrs. Veronica Jones, um, who served as the event planner um, for our event, and to recognize as well the feminist leadership of Dr. Halima Deshong. And just to shout out all of the Nita Barra unit staff who made this happen. Um, in collaboration with the staff of the Faculty of, the, of Culture, Creative, and Performing Arts, particularly at the Errol Barra Center for Creative Imagination. Um, I now have a list of offices of the UWI um, and others that I need to read that, to whom we also extend gratitude the Office of the Campus Registrar, the Office of the Campus Bursar, the Errol Barra Center for Creative Imagination, the UWI Ushers, the University Bookshop, and just to say that you absolutely can go outside and you can get your copy of How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House, and you can also have the pleasure of having it signed. Um, campus Security Services, Lanique's Catering, who are going to support us with a very lovely reception. Um, Gardenia Floral, members of the tenantry, members of the planning committee, and also I want to thank Dr. Stefan Walcott as well. Um, so at this point, it is my sincere pleasure to invite all of you to join us outside for a lovely reception, sorry? Um, so let me hand back over, <laughs> let me hand back over to the chair, um, but, Sincere thanks to you all. The, the chair will, will invite you outside a little bit later. We just have one more um, presentation to me. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I felt like one of those Muppets on Sesame Street putting in a parent. Um, to thank Ms. Jones properly for her excellent presentation this evening. I'm going to invite back to the podium Ms. Lisa Bino to present her with a small token of our appreciation. And thank you all for coming out, ladies and gentlemen. This is the first time we've been together uh, in person in a couple of years. So if you can spare the time, please stay with us, have a few drinks, and let's continue the discussion on the thought-provoking presentation we had this evening. Thank you all, and when you return to your homes, please do so safely. Thank you. Good night.